So I don't have a lot of time, so I want to go through customer engagement with you and what it is and clarify some things and get through a, a lot of stuff. So I'm going to talk. I'm, I, I am a New Yorker in addition to being a Yankees fan, so I'm going to be talking really, really fast. Um, as soon as I can get this thing to work. Whoop, that didn't do it. Ah, got it. All right, so let's start here. I want to start by disabusing you of something, right? A lot of people think that what we've undergone these last few years is a business revolution. You're wrong. It's actually been a communications revolution that's transformed every single institution on this planet, how individuals interact with each other, how they interact with those institutions, how institutions interact with each other, how we communicate, with whom we communicate, who we trust, with the devices we use, the expectation of the communication, also, how we create, how we consume, or how we distribute and consume information. This is what's happened. Business is just a part of it. It's been a fundamental transformation of the way the world interacts. And Ray pointed out some of the more dramatic side of it, which is the more, and, and the future side of it, and even the sort of near, pre, I call it the near future and, and immediate present. But we're also dealing with something which involves transformation from a past that we have to begin to overcome and extend and grow from, but it doesn't mean throwing baby out with bathwater either. So the first question is, who's the digital customer? And one thing I'm sure of is every single one of you is one. Oh, well, most every one of you, I'll say that. But there's some things that businesses have to know about digital customers that are rather important, and one of the most important ones when it boils down to it, all of these things are who digital customers are. And because the, there is a, a limitation in time, these slides will be made available to anyone who wants them. You just have to contact John or Brent, and they will give them to you. They're all yours. So there'll be more information on these slides than I go through. But one of the ones I want to go through most importantly, which starts addressing the issue of trust, is the one that says communicates with peers. We know peer trust. We know it because of what? The review process. Well. Back in 2000, for the first time, the Edelman Group created what's called the Edelman Trust Barometer. And the Edelman Trust Barometer is a trusted source now of who is your most trusted source. And back then, in the irony of ironies, the most trusted source in the world was financial experts. Right? So, and you saw where that got us, right? So, what happened though, there, uh, in 2004, a category appeared, which had never appeared before. It was called a person like me. Now, a person like me didn't mean a relative. It didn't mean a blood relative of any kind. It meant just someone who you, and this is the scientific use of this word, felt was like you. Someone who you thought was similar to you. And you know who those people are, because how many people here use review sites for anything? Yeah, pretty much 100%. All right, so think of that. Think of the way you use it. Say you're looking for the, uh, the, the best pecan pie in Atlanta, which theoretically is at Southern State's Kitchen, although I actually like the, a, a different dessert. We had a pineapple cake much better. But you're looking for that. And you're looking on all these review sites, and they're rating things one through five stars. And there's one that says five stars, the service isn't, four stars, the service isn't great, but the pecan pie is just unreal. And then there's another one that says one star, service sucks, the rest of the food sucks, but the pecan pie, unreal, right? And you're starting to look at all these different things. They say well, pecan pie is really good, service is amazing, rest of the food's great. Now, everyone in this audience, without exception, is looking at this, filtering it, and filtering it differently according to what they want. But here's the funny part of it. You're automatically trusting these reviewers. And the only thing you might know about them is that one of their email handles is like, you know, rabiddog at gmail.com, but you're still trusting that reviewer. It's an automatic. Why? Because you feel that they're a person like you. And that's what peer trust is. When you're looking at a review site, or we're now seeing the rise of the idea of influencers, when it comes to brand, that's a person like you who's actually, and that was in 2006, the Edelman Trust Barometer found for the first time that 
a person like you would be seen as a credible spokesperson, the influencers, right? Now, the number in 2004 of most trusted source was a person like you was 23%. The number in 2014, 15, and I think 16, don't hold me the last one, was 82%. Right? Peer trust is dominant. You've seen the numbers a million times, right? If you look at some studies, you'll see brand trust. Who trusts the brand on what they say about the brand? And the number, the low number you'll see is about 12%, and the high number you'll see is 53. When it comes to peer trust about brands, the low number you see is 72%, and the high number is 94. It's pretty obvious, okay? So I won't, I won't belabor the point, but keep the point in mind. Now, also, as this digital customer is evolving, in 2009, something new occurred. Two studies came out, one from Nielsen and uh, the other one from Morgan Stanley, and they said, for the first time in history, more people are communicating via social networks than email. Now, here's the deal. I can find data to prove anything I want when I go up on this stage, and if I want to make that the case and give you the studies, I can. But I also can find 20 that say the opposite that year, that say there's still more people communicating on email and social networks. But you know what's important about those two studies? Not that they prove that point, that they exist at all. The very fact is, if you look at a 1,000 study and two show up that say that, that means the volume of activity on social networks is so great that they're bubbling to the surface as a result, right, with those kind of results. And that means they have to become a business consideration at that point. Not because they're proving something that we're all sitting up trying to be alpha about. It's because they're showing you a trend that's important enough for you to start to consider. It's not just the study. It's the volume of studies against the, and the existence. Two, three years before that, no studies would have shown up showing that. That's the point. The volume of activity was critical. Now, Brian Solis did this thing a few years ago, a couple of years ago, well, the conversation prism. And this is just a look at channels that are out there that are open to people who are communicating via peer communication. And each of those colors is a different category, not just a channel. I mean, and then there's the channels within the category of channels are all those individual logos that are there. So you're talking about thousands of channels, and that's led to what from a strategy standpoint when it came to businesses? Well, originally, we were talking multi-channel. What was that? Multi-channel, when it came to a customer, was find the channel that they like communicating on the most and then optimize to that channel. Well, guess what? That's not the world as it exists anymore. We don't think about the channel we're going to communicate on. The vast majority of us communicate on multiple channels, and it's given circumstances and time. It could be five in a day, three in a day. You'll see what I mean in a second. You see this? This is a conversation between me and my niece. She was turning 18, getting ready to go to college. My wife and I decided we'd buy her a laptop because that's what she wanted for college. So the way it started was I got a tweet, a public tweet from her saying, You'll see it at the top. It says, at P. Greenby, which is my Twitter handle, I need your cell number, hashtag love my uncle, hashtag miss you guys. I mean, she's one of those kids that's 130 characters of hashtags and 10 of actual, you know, tweet. So why, what I did was I DM'd her my cell number. All right? Didn't hear from her for about 12 hours, 14 hours. Sent her a note, on fa a message on Facebook said, hey, you want to talk during the week about the laptop? If it works for both of us, you can get it next weekend. Big hug, Uncle Paul. She says, that sounds good on Facebook. Then I want you to listen to this particular one. Did you get, this is me. Did you get my cell on Twitter? I DM'd you with the number. This is on Facebook. All right, we'll keep going here. She says, yes, I got your number. I'll text you so you have mine. So then she texts me, and that's this whole discussion on when we're back and forth on when we're going to talk on Skype. <laughs> and then we talked on Skype, and then we actually physically met, went to the store, and bought the laptop. Now, that's in the space of 36 hours, six channels we communicated on. Now, she's 18 years old. It's organic to her. But here's the deal. I'm old enough for Medicare, and it's organic for me. 
right? It's not a generational thing. It has nothing to do with generations anymore. It has to do with the fact that as customers, this is simply the way we communicate. And that's a digital customer. Now, I, I'm going to skip past that. So we're going to go to this now. We're going to go, we go back. We're still looking at a little bit of history before we get into the current situation. Again, I have to be mindful of time. Um, several years ago, IBM, uh, the IBM Institute for Business Value, who do, do absolutely phenomenal research, and it's agnostic research. If, if you want to take a look at some great stuff, go take a look at their CEO, CMO, CIO kind of uh, studies and surveys they do every year. Some of the stuff they did one called uh, from uh, uh, social media to social CRM, which was a, par a, para a paramount kind of study they did uh, several years ago. Well, here's, here's a discussion or a uh, survey they did. And they were looking at why businesses think consumers uh, follow them on social media. Number one, businesses said, learn about new products. And they said the least possible, the least reason is actually purchases and discounts. Then they looked at consumers and said, why do you follow businesses on social media? Look at what number one and two are, purchases and discounts. You literally can't get a bigger possible disconnect. It's impossible. You'd be off this slide to do that. You'd be down here, right? Purchases and discounts, purchases and discounts. I can't reach that high, right? Purchases and discounts. They, the disconnect was total. But in 2010, to the credit of all these customers, when it comes to engagement, when it comes, I mean, the credit of all the businesses, when it comes to engagement, IBM did their CEO study, and they found what? 88% of the CEOs understood that their most important initiative, and this is 1,700 CEOs, understood their most important initiative was getting closer to their customer in the next over the next five years. That was their most important initiative. And they have to stay connected and keep on getting strengthening the bond, meaning get more closer and more intimate, know more about the customer. This is their five-year required strategy, number one possible thing they could do. All right? So that, if you think about it, they're aware. It takes them to 2015. How'd they do? So to do that, we're going to start looking at what customer engagement isn't and is. Understand the context given the digital customer. McKinsey, in 2014, did two studies. In January 2014, did a study and said, hey, businesses, hey, enterprises, what's the top 10 thing that, the top 10 things that you're looking at this year for your initiative? Number three was customer engagement. Then in July, they did another study. And that study was, hey, you're undergoing digital, whoops, bye, it's updating. You're undergoing digital transformation um, what is the top three, uh, what are the top three, uh, top five reasons for undergoing digital transformation at your company? 69% said the number one reason, customer engagement. Number one. So top 10, it was number three, and uh, with companies that are a little more advanced, it was number one. Meaning, it went from being a subject of important uh, discussion to a major initiative when it came to businesses. All right, now, what does that mean, though? What is, how do they implement, how do they execute? All right, first thing to do, before you understand what customer engagement is, is to understand what customer engagement is not, okay? Because the confusion between CRM, customer engagement, customer experience is pretty massive, actually. And, you know, to, uh, my own sadness, I think I probably contributed a fair amount to the confusion. Uh, but first thing to understand what it isn't is it doesn't mean marriage to the customer. Remember the point that was made this morning about um, treating the customer as a guest. Well, on the other side of that, customers don't want to love your company necessarily, maybe one or two. We all have companies we kind of love. But for the most part, that's not what we're doing that for. Most of us, it's relatively, for, let's say for 95% of your business, it's utilitarian. All right, meaning you're, you want to buy something, so you buy it. That's how it works, right? And some others, you fall in love with the company over time. You think they're great. You want them to be 
like you. You want them to actually be a company like you, and those are the companies you stick with and you're loyal to and advocates for. But engagement, engagement's bigger than all that. The other thing engagement isn't is advocacy or loyalty. It drives it, but it's not it. Okay? Um, there are dozens of other things that you could call engagement. Oh, it's starting. There are dozens of other things you could call engage. I have some really cool slides later, so as long as it's up by then, uh, that you can call engagement, but it's not those. Now, what it's also not is customer experience. There's two ways to look at customer experience. One is to understand it for what it is, which is how a customer feels about a company over time, period. It's not that complicated in that regard. It's very complicated in terms of what you do with that, how you measure it, how you get to it, how you actually make the customer experience great, but the concept's simple. How a customer feels about a company over time. Now, there is another facet, though, that's very important, and it, comes, it actually involves engagement and involves what you do with the customer, which is what Joe Pine, back in the late 90s, called uh, consumable experiences. How many people here have ever taken their daughter to uh, American Girl. Okay, now let me ask you the same question in a minute again. So if you go to American Girl, you, you know, first of all, the whole concept of American Girl, which is Mattel's most successful division by a long shot now, Barbie is way down below it. Um, if you go to American Girl, what happens at the store? Well, one is you already have a doll with a story associated with it. There's lots of accessories you can buy to, with that story. So it would be an Amish bed, if that happens to be the story. It could be, it could be dozens of other things. Secondly, though, when you go to the store, you can do things with your doll, not just buy accessories, not just buy other dolls, not just get the story, but you can do things. So you can go to the theater with your doll and watch a play about a doll, and you can get your hair cut with a doll, and you can eat lunch with a doll. Now, here's the deal. The doll doesn't know you're doing any of that, <laughs> but you're doing it, right? And the, your daughter sure does, though. And it costs you, when you walk out of there, about $400 more than you walked in with. It's pretty expensive. However, let me ask you this question. Those of you who have been there, how many would not bring your daughter back there? Of course you would, because of the smile on your daughter's face. That's why you bring them back. That's a consumable experience. It has nothing to do with the product. It has to do with the overall situation. What you took them to is consumable, meaning it's also transactionable, right? But it, it's, it's an experience you're paying for. And you heard Ray talk about Disney and the Magic Band and the experiences at Disney. I mean, these are the kind of things that are consumable. But how a customer feels over time is customer experience. Now, CRM. How is that different than customer engagement? Well, <laughs> Go back to the old days, which unfortunately I'm well associated with, and say you have me, and we had Brent, and Esteban Kolsky here, and, and Ray, who you saw, and others, and Mike Fawcett, who's somewhere here. There he is, over there. I mean, these are people who were associated, from, and David Myron, the guy you saw on stage, Serum Magazine, Ginger Conley. I can keep going, actually. I can name everybody in this audience who, who, who has been around a while on the CRM world. We all wanted it to be more than what people see it as. We wanted it to be a philosophy. We wanted it to be strategy. We wanted it to be programmatic. We wanted it to be a way people looked at the world. But unfortunately, it's viewed as technology, period. If you say CRM to someone, they're going to name it technology. That's how they think of it. At a certain point, you give up that battle, and you don't win the fight. You don't win that war. We, that happened about 2011 or 2012, all right? So what we now look at CRM as, and I have a very complicated definition, which I will not go through here, but uh, what we see CRM as is really the technology and systems that support the, the business operations of customer-facing departments. That's the simple way of putting it, okay? That's what they are, sales, marketing, customer service, technologies. You can, you can add more to it, but at this point, there's no reason to. All right, so that's what CRM, I mean, that's what customer engagement is not. So what is it? Well, all right, so I have a very, there's a number of definitions which I can't show you, but I'm going to tell you mine, because this is the only one I actually like, because it's mine. You know, why wouldn't I like it? Uh, so if I didn't like it, I'd be, 
a very masochistic individual. Uh, so the definition I have of customer engagement is pretty simple in concept, or, but it's, it's complex in terms of what it implies. It's the ongoing interactions between company and customer, and here's the key part of it, offered by the company, chosen by the customer. And the reason I give it that definition is this. This is a two-way street. We all love the idea of delighting our customer all the time. To be perfectly honest, that's a stupid idea, because you're going to go broke if you try to do that. It's a really good idea to be good enough for your customer at all times, which is all they really expect, right? And delight them occasionally. That's the idea of delight. The idea, you know what the key is and when you delight your customer successfully? When, when the delight, delightful part is done, they don't expect it again. If they expect it again, it's no longer delight, it's expectation, and all of a sudden the bar's raised on you. And you're going to have to spend more and do more things and change the bar. That's not the way delight works. Delight is an exceptional experience. It's not, a, it's not an expectation. Expectation is expectation, right? So what we're talking about is, we'll have to figure out where in the hell I am on this. Uh, what we're talking about is, uh, is how to be good enough for the customer. Now, when that comes to that, and you're a company with millions of customers, that's a big deal. Because think of it this way. Right now, every company starts with the idea that constraints drive it. They're driven by constraints. They're driven by budget carry constraints, time constraints, personnel constraints, regulatory constraints, legal constraints. I can keep going. They're driven by constraints. And you have to work within those constraints. If you don't work within those constraints, you go broke, you fail, you have no choice. Regulatory constraints especially, you have to follow them. On the other hand, the customer doesn't give a crap about whether you have constraints or not. The customer says this, I'm one of 300 million customers you have. You're a giant enterprise. And you know what? Not only do I care about your constraints, I don't actually care about the other 299,999,999 customers either. I care about what you do for me. And what I need at this time is this, whatever this is. And customers have an immediate real-time expectation now. All right. So what does that say? Well, at the same time, you don't want to drive away every customer either by saying, ah, go to hell. You know, I mean, you say, look, all right, we'll figure out what's good enough for you. But here's how we'll do it. The good thing is you've got a lot of access to data these days. And you've got transactional data, of course, which you've had access to. If you have a CRM system, that's one of its benefits as a system of record. And at the other side, you have social and personal data that's out there that you are, let's say, the customer has provided to make it available, meaning you haven't gone and stolen it from somewhere. You have all that. Now, if you put together things, here's what tends to happen, and, and demographic data. You put together things, here's what happens. Historically, if you put it together, you use the demographic data. Here's what you, Paul Greenberg, New York Jewish guy, loves the Yankees. But I'm, I'm Paul Greenberg first, and I'm also from New York, also Jewish, also love the Yankees, meaning there's lots of New York Jewish guys who love the Yankees, right? So, but I still want to be treated as Paul Greenberg regardless of that demographic. That's the difference between now and in the past. In the past, I didn't mind being part of a demographic. Now I do, right? I, I only want you to use that information to help figure out how you're going to deal with me. All right. But that information's out there. So here's what you find, though. And this is one of the key things with customer engagement. Is if you have 300 million customers, when you look at the data and you analyze, you do all the crunching you have to do, and that's all that big data made into insight, right? Uh, d developing information and knowledge and then insight. What you find is this. Oh, you know what? 106 million people of that 300 million people have these 17 things they all like in common. And another 110 million have these 33 things, and it overlaps a little bit with the other 106. And you keep going like that, and you find out ultimately that you can please 270 million of those customers with, let's say, 90% of those customers with a market basket of, I'm totally inventing numbers here, but uh, 88 offerings. And then you say, OK, customers, here's the deal. Uh, Here's 88 things. You pick the ones you, you pick the ones or the six that will allow you to pick that you want. And now, obviously, it's a little more subtle than all this, but the idea is that you're giving them choice. Because that's the other side of this. When you're dealing with customers, when you're dealing with engagement, 
what happens? You're dealing with people who want to be happy. They want control over their life. They want, that's the only thing all humans have in common is that. We all want to be happy, right? And not only do we want to be happy, we want to be happy on our journey to happiness. It's not like we just want to get to happiness someday. We want to be happy along the way. And to the extent that we can provide control over your choice to you, to give you control over that choice, you're happier because you're picking things that are meaningful to you, which means it becomes personalized. It's not like you're dealing with a person. We talk about Amazon all day. You never deal with people at Amazon. But Amazon manages to personalize the experience. That's the key to engagement. The key to engagement is giving people control over the choices that you have decided to provide them as a business. It's not over giving them everything because they want everything. And the numbers become really good. So here's a Salesforce partner. That's, they, sur they surveyed Salesforce customers. 60% of respondents said customer engagement tech was their top priority. But the most interesting figure was the second one. 84% said customer engagement overtake productivity as the company's primary driver of growth. That's where we're going. That's what, and customers who are in control of their conversation, customers right now are driving all of that. And, and the results seem really good. Now, what I'm going to do because of this, well, actually, I'm going to stop right here, and then we're going to go to examples so I can close. The irony of all of this, and this is truly the irony of it all, is that the simplest principle on the planet governs everything that's going on. And that's, whoops, that's not it. <laughs> that's it. If a customer likes you and continues to like you, they'll continue to do business with you. If they don't, they won't. But like means good enough. It doesn't mean delight every second of the day. That just enters the realm of orgasmic, right? That's not what they're looking for. They're looking for getting the job done in a way that makes them feel like they had control over what they did. And if you can give them that which is enough, they're happy. You can automate 90% of that. The other 10% can't be automated. And customer experience, by the way, there's no such thing, just to be clear, and then we're going to go to examples to close, there's no such thing as customer experience technology. You can't automate a feeling. Okay, That's why you never hear of systems of experience. You hear of systems of engagement because you can actually develop technology for interaction. That's how uh, gamification is a great example if you want to look at it. Systems of record because you can capture data and put it somewhere. But you don't have systems of experience for that reason because you can't automate how someone feels about you over time. It doesn't work that way. So be suspicious when you hear it. All right. Now, in the interest of time, I was going to do two examples, but I'm only going to be able to do one, I think. Uh, it's too bad. I'd like to tell you why I hate Radiohead, too. But people are welcome to ask me that after this is over. I'm probably going to skip this one, although I'm going to keep with a sports theme. Again, these are for you. You can have these slides. And they're explanatory enough. In keeping with this afternoon's sports theme, now, I also have to be clear here, I'm a Rangers fan. Okay, I'm not a Flyers fan. But the Rangers suck at customer engagement. The Flyers are amazing at customer engagement. Right? So, and I've known, I've actually done stuff with the Flyers since 2003. I've known them that long. All right. The thing with the Flyers, and why they're the be one of the best examples of engagement for business, period is that they understand it strategically, and they execute to the individual. Now, understand something about sports. And Brent and I both sit on the board of something called SEAT, Sports Entertainment Alliance and Technology, which is a consortium of business executives who are mostly engaged in sports. Uh, the prime customer of a sports team, season ticket holder. That is the key customer, period. They love the other fans. There's lots of other businesses associated with that, food and merchandise and so on and so forth. But the key is the season ticket holder. These guys understood both kinds of customer. They developed one program called How You Doing, the other one called Early Bird. How You Doing, named after Joey and friends, it's been a while, around a while, right, as a program was, how do you engage the fans 
in any environment whatsoever that you're in, be it at the headquarters, at the stadium, whatever. How do you do that? All right? So, Sean Tilger, who's the SVP of Business Operations, really their COO, this is his way of looking at it. The how you do in program is the culture of this organization. We're always making sure we aren't just implementing software, but are embedding the philosophy and outlook into everything we do internally and externally. And that is literally the case. This isn't just marketing crap. This is actually the way they work. So how does it work? Well, think of this. You're a Flyers fan. You walk into the stadium. You're greeted immediately by somebody. Somebody will greet you. The person says, we'll say, how you doing? And they'll say, do you have any questions you'd like us to answer as you're coming in? And if you do, they are empowered to leave their station and go get the question answered on the spot. And someone else will just fill in, right? They, and then, in the meantime, you've been handed a card. So they go out. If it takes them 15 minutes, they've got to bring you with them. They'll bring you with them. If they don't have to bring you with them, you can wait there. They'll come back, but they'll get the answer to your question. Then they give you this card that said, how would we do? Right? And then on the back of the card, you rate them one through five, and then you can name a specific name of an employee if you like that. All of this has meaning. You'll see in a minute. So what happens, right? Every question gets answered, and the fans are engaged immediately. They have a social presence, but that really isn't the strength. So look at these numbers just on the basis of how you're doing. 87% of all the fans are actually engaged with and greeted. Out five out of five rating, 97% of the fans gave them five out of five. That's an astonishing experience as you walk in the door. And by the way, the way those cards are handled, those little cards, there's drop points all over the stadium. There's no pressure. If you want to, you fill them out and you drop them in. I don't know if they have, an, I've never seen a number that says how many, what percentage drops them, but it's high. Now, here's the thing. If you're, if you're coming in by the season's boxes, you're going to get this. It's called early bird. All right, and what's early bird? Early bird says this. Look, our lifeblood is season's ticket holders. The earlier we get them to renew, the more revenue in the bank, the more we can think about other things, right? The more that we know what, we're, what we have to do over the year. The key isn't getting them to renew. It's to get them to renew early. And so when you come to the season's ticket holder area and you come in, you get this. You get this card. It tells you where you can just go behind the stands and renew in some various places. Notice it says there, uh, access to the barbecue. Just keep that in your heads. Choice of gift, exclusive, uh, and benefit. All right. So what happened? Well, they tried a lot of stuff in terms of early bird. And they had this really cool video, which I actually took a picture of. We did this really amazing mobile thing. I'm not going to tell you about it because it takes too much time. But ask me about it when you get a minute. It really was cool. But the amount of value to them, zero. Nothing happened. Oh, that's cool, the end, right? And that doesn't work for a business. It's great. Works for an eight, eight-year-old kid, but it doesn't work for a business. Right? So they couldn't do that. So they said, all right, throw it all out. Client development, season ticket holders, set up accounts, do it by accounts. Take all our data, and they have a ton of data from ticket holder, ticket master data, and other data. Send it over to this company. Have them analyze it. Propensity to renew one star through five stars, develop programs according to where they rate on the one to five star. Every season ticket holder was given that. And, and then what happened? They said, all right, one star we'll put aside for now. They'll just come to stadium. We'll make sure their experience is good. Two and three stars, though, every game will do these little get-togethers in the Hall of Fame room at Wells Fargo. Now, keep in mind, to be a season ticket holder is because you believe in the team and you know the history. The Hall of Fame room, if you've ever seen it, has every player, plaques, pictures, it's an amazing room, and the whole history of the team is there. Then they fed you, let's say, comfort food. Beer, wine, snacks, ice cream, key ice cream, of course. Now, I have this uh, saying, you don't have to have luxury, you just have to feel luxurious, right? Ice cream, right? That, that, it's that feeling, right? It's, you can have a cheap watch, but if you love the watch and you feel luxurious, you feel luxurious, which is good. It's better than anything else. All right. So what happens? You're in that room. You're being sold the history. You're being sold the season's ticket. And you're getting all this comfort food. All right? That's one part. The four and five stars got a postcard. Yes, an actual paper thing. It's made of cardboard. You might have seen them when, if you're older than 60. Right? So postcard. And it came to their house. And they actually looked at it because they're Flyers fans. They didn't just throw it in with all the other snail mail. Right? So what's on it? 
Well, on the left, things you get. On the right, things you could win. I'm going to highlight one of the things you could you get, because I don't even have children, and this choked me up, right? This is if you have a kid between 8 and 14 years old, they get to go out on the ice and high-five the team in the real game. That's amazing. If I, when I was 8, 9 through 14, I would have killed for that. I definitely would have made my father a newer early season's ticket holder if he was a Flyers fan. But the other thing, remember I said the barbecue? Everybody who renewed early got that, all two, one through five. That's the team barbecue, right? You go to the team barbecue with the team, and every single person who did that can go, and that could be thousands of people, but they were willing to invest. Now, what were the results? The one star, now keep in mind, this is a three-year, year-over-year renewal rate that increased by 1,000 people over the prior year, each year. Here's the early renewal of total season's ticket holders. One star, 83.7. Two star, 87.5. Three star, 84.3. Four star, 89.1. Five star, 92. That's phenomenal. And again, 1,000 a year more than the previous year. Holy crap. That's engagement. That's customer engagement. Why? They understood the propensity of every individual. They understood the personal needs and likes of every individual. They handle the ambiance. They handle everything. All right. So in closing, what are we saying here? Develop, be strategic about customer engagement, understand what it is first, then understand it has to be good enough, not delightful all the time, and then understand you have to execute against it, not just talk about it, and actually develop the plans that will interact with your individual customers in a way that satisfies the bulk of them, not necessarily all of them, because you're never going to do that, right? The bulk of them. That's how you develop strategy, and then keep learning from your mistakes as you go along. I didn't have time to go into their mistakes, but they had. And with that, I, love, I just love that slide. <laughs> I do, right? With that, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm around for the rest of the day, so if you have any interest, please feel free to come and talk. Let's give them a round of applause. That's awesome.